am Catherine Crossfield. I'm the Senior Specialist Catering Dietitian at Leeds Teaching Hospitals Trust. And I'm also the previous co-chair for the dietetic subgroup of the expert panel. Um, and I'm also extremely nervous, so please do <laughs> be kind. I wanted to start, do bear with me, it seems a really random place to start, but um, a couple of months ago, my mum, as only any 70-year-old can do, produced this leaflet for me at home and brought it round. Um, and it was written by the British Medical Association. I mean, it's that old, it doesn't even have a date on it, which is saying a lot. But from a bit of a search online, it looks like it was produced from, it was part of, sorry, a series of booklets they produced in 1957. And there's actually a couple of quotes I want to read from it to you all. By the way, if anyone does want to have a look at it later, it's pretty fantastic in parts. But anyway, um, so the quotes are, food can be fun or it can be almost anything that you care to make it. Get the right foods in the right balance and cook them with loving care. That alone will do more to ensure the continuing good health and zest and vitality than any amount of vitamin concentrates, pep pills, or nutty health foods. And the other one is, shop as carefully as ever and don't spend any more. You don't need to, but spend it differently. Look at all the foods you've never tried and try those. You'll hate half of them, but you will love the other half and wonder why on earth you never tried them years ago. So if these quotes still apply, almost 70 years later, we're using the same information 70 years on, why do we need new roles of food service dietitians for the trusts that don't already have them? Um, in the early days, it should be noted that dietitians were an integral part of catering departments, but staffing shortages in the 1960s and changes in medical nutrition therapy led to food services taking more of a back seat with dietetic roles. But over the last couple of decades, there has been a lot more recognition for these roles again. The current guidance then in relation to food service dietitians. Food service dietitians are discussed in multiple different guidance and standards. Some care settings are fortunate that we already have food service dietitians embedded within the catering teams, but for others it would be a really innovative step and offer that dedicated support to both the catering team and the patients. So the independent review of NHS Hospital Food does discuss food service dietitians throughout. So meeting the nutritional needs of the general hospital population and the particular needs of individuals requires a dedicated dietitian to work within the catering department. And we recommend that there is a named food service dietitian to promote improvement through food and beverage services in every trust. This person will act as the main interface between catering and clinical services and it should be a senior post and funded as such so that the dietitian has sufficient authority and experience to lead developments and initiate resolution of problems. It does also contain information on how many hours a food service dietitian should be within the team in relation to bed capacity of the trusts. The national standards state organisations must consider the level of input from a food service dietitian to ensure choices are appropriate. The digest states food service dietitians drive improvement through food and drink services that are good quality, safe, nutritionally adequate, patient focused and represent good value for money. And it's discussed in place as well. The question is, has the menu been approved by a registered dietitian? So, what do food service dietitians do? So before we talk about what they can do for your trust, I thought it was good to give an overview of what they've actually been doing. So they have recently, as a group from the BDA, the Food Services Specialist Group. So this is a group that food service dietitians can choose to be a part of. We work together improving the provision for patients and providing that support network for food service dietitians or those with an interest in the area. So they've recently, um, created a two-day training module. They've developed and delivered that on a couple of occasions. And that's been attended by people who are already in food services, dietetics-wise, or those who have a strong interest in it who li would like to go into it. They've updated the third edition of the Nutrition and Hydration Digest. So as you all know, that's a fundamental resource for all of us involved in healthcare catering. And the FSSG work therefore directly impacts on all UK patients. It does, if you are considering the role, contain a JD and business case guidance as well. 
They've produced resources for care homes and mental health and learning disability settings and provided representatives to the UK IDSI Festival, the NH Chef of the Year competition, the NHSE Hospital Food Review, NHSE National Nutrition and Hydration Advisory Board. They've led a working party of representatives of the NACC and BDA Older Persons Specialist Group to develop food service guidelines for care homes and contributed to the Healthcare Chef's Knowledge and the Manual of Dietetic Practice. Understandably, with all that, they were shortlisted for the BDA Group of the Year 2024. So with regards then to your specific trusts, what can a food service dietitian do to influence a positive mealtime experience? Because that is what we want for all of our patients. So starting at the top, age old, power of three. So the hospital food review does document the importance of that constant communication in both directions and that cooperation between dietitians, nursing and catering teams, as, as well as other groups as well, such as speech and language. A food service dietitian can act as a link between the clinical teams and catering, ensuring that robust communication can work in both directions. The promotion of nutrition hydration requires a constant drive to be effective. The power of three empowers dietitians, caterers and nursing to join up decision making for patient care. In relation to the food services dietitian, this support should be dedicated hours. They need that opportunity to gatekeep the time that allocated to catering without being pulled by clinical pressures. Procurement and recipes then. It can be a really difficult task to source and produce the best possible food service. It's important to ensure the task of choosing items on the menu, both for individual items or creation of recipes, is completed by a team. They may all have different priorities. Support. The role can advocate for food services at all levels across the trust. This might be audits and gathering patient feedback at meal services to being a representative on trust nutrition steering groups or supporting with nutritional policies or generally having a proactive awareness of relevant standards, guidelines and legislation. They can be involved in problem solving. So those with dedicated hours can support with day-to-day -day problem solving. For example, patients with um, individuals with complex nutritional needs or complex allergies, missing or incorrect deliveries they can support with because they can help to choose which would be the suitable replacement products to use instead. Then we have dietary requirements. So obviously staff should be aware of any dietary requirements, allergies, texture modifications, or any concerns about meal times. The information needs to be recorded for the individuals and it should be ensured that patient's food provision is appropriate for them and safe. Dietitians can support teams to ensure individuals with complex dietary needs are catered for and that the alternative menus provide products for a patient to choose from that are safe. And then finally, food. So obviously, just one piece of the puzzle. The food itself needs to be nutritious, tasty, well presented, all of which the team have to work with together and the food service dietitian can support with that. So understanding individual patient needs. Um, so obviously different settings, different wards, different individuals, how can we best cater for our patients? So the independent review of NHS hospital food states that it was vital that hospitals pay, pay close attention to the different needs of patients, staff and visitors. Those needs are going to vary across different settings, different wards and even between individuals. Patients in mental health facilities may be more likely to face obesity related health problems. Long stay patients are more likely to get tired of our rotating menus. Some patients in acute settings might be at higher risk of malnutrition therefore needing higher energy and higher protein diets. Patients with diabetes may need easy access to appropriate snacks and drinks so that they can self-manage their condition when appropriate. We need to ensure that the standards we apply to different settings are appropriate for the different needs of the patient groups. Dietitians are well placed to help tailor the food to these different patient needs, drawing on their clinical and nutritional expertise. And then understanding patient needs. So to meet the patient needs, obviously, as I've just said, there are generalized rules in certain areas and things that may crop up as more problems, but also we have to think of the individuals. So a qu quote from Dame Pruleith, who was the advisor to the independent review of NHS hospital food, says, diet is an individual thing. Taking account of a patient's current health, their medical problems, their cultural or religious beliefs, their allergies, and their likes and dislikes. 
Hospitals need expert help from dietitians, and not least the excellent British Dietetic Association's updated Nutrition and Hydration Digest. Every patient is an individual. We cannot make assumptions about their dietary needs or preferences, and we've got to try and go that extra mile to provide what an individual needs. CQC's fundamental standards includes good nutrition and hydration. All care settings are expected to provide individuals with adequate nutrition to sustain good health. The Digest states that patients' food preferences need to be understood by the catering teams, both on an individual level and as a wider view of population needs and preferences. This should be considered when planning menus to provide the most appropriate options for patients to choose from. So how do we do that? Regular feedback could be feedback on the wards, electronic feedback, paper forms, verbal feedback to our catering staff, changes following Datexes or PALs. To be able to provide to our patients, we need to listen to what they actually need. Patients and staff need to feel free, safe, and encouraged to share feedback. And catering also needs to feel free and safe to receive that feedback so that developments and improvements can be made for patients. We then have patient and carer working groups and also their involvement with menus. So it may be in the early stages of menu planning with taste testings. It could be a formal group arrangement or it could be a taste testing session with feedback on the wards. It may be specific groups from the community who can support and provide knowledge on specific cultural menus. There are many ways that we can ask for patient feedback and we need to make sure we utilise it. Then we have the clinical team involvement and those close links between the teams. Uh, collaboration across the specialities is key to understanding what patients actually require. The clinical teams are the specialists in their areas and will see the food provision on the wards. They will know the best areas for development and any gaps in meeting patient needs for their clinical areas. We should ensure that we communicate with them. They'll also be able to assess if an individual has specific dietary needs and what is necessary to fulfill those. For example, a low fiber patient for patient a low fiber menu, sorry, for a patient with intestinal failure or idsy menus of specific levels, with the latter being demonstrated uh, by Neve and Tim shortly. The availability of specialist products in some areas is extremely important and cannot be underestimated. And as much as the clinical teams have, these knowledge, have the knowledge of what these patients need, the caterers will have the knowledge of how it can be provided. We need ward housekeepers who are trained in the importance of listening to patients and acting upon their needs. Uh, the importance of good nutrition and hydration, the absolute importance of allergies and raising problems with their supervisors so that patients can be offered optimal care. One way to give patients more control over their meals and meeting their dietary needs is the, is the option to allow them to choose their own portion sizes. It's simply done a tick box maybe on a top of a paper menu or a tick box within your electronic menus and that would allow that individual to choose if they would prefer a smaller portion. At times bespoke information may be needed as well, for example nutritional content or ingredient analysis. A process should be in place for the provision of this information which may allow the individual to choose their own appropriate dishes. Um, and I also wanted to touch on assisted meal times before I hand over to Neve and Tim. Um, one of the important topics, it was actually raised by the dietetic subgroup of the expert panel, following on from the um, NHS hospital food review, and that was assisted meal times. As a group, we felt the message behind assisted meal times had either been lost or had become a bit unclear over the last few years. It, it's understandable, obviously we had a huge change to our practices due to COVID and there was a new normal in place and new staff started within that time and there was new rules put in place but assisted meal times had the message behind it anecdotally we found had been lost. So as a group we wanted to find a way to re-promote that message behind assisted meal times. We formed a small working group with representatives from the British Dietetic Association, Hospital Caterers Association, British Association for Parental and Enteral Nutrition, Royal College of Nursing and Malnutrition Task Force. We've worked together to create two resources. One is aimed at supporting meal and snack times um, and that's for staff, and one aimed at patients, which tells them what they can expect at meal and snack times. The resources don't contain brand new information, but it's important information to support them about what can be expected and what they should be providing at the important stages in meal and snack services, 
before, during and after. They contain information we should all know and all be practicing at each meal and snack service, but they don't always occur for one reason or another. These resources have now been shared within the above associations for feedback and then sent to the patient association as well for feedback from a patient perspective. So they are quite robustly um, created. We're currently working with the endorsement teams from each of these groups for sign off um, on their approval and endorsements of these important national documents. Unfortunately, we don't have a date for launch of these yet, but we wanted to highlight we've been working on this topic, and when the launch date is known, it will be widely shared within networks. Some of you also will have seen it from different circulation systems, I'm aware, um, but we are, we are looking forward to being able to finalize them and launch them. So in summary, um, the need for a food service dietitian with dedicated hours is widely recognized within guidance and standards, and if you don't currently have one, please consider why not. There is a JD and business case guidance within the BDA's third edition if you are considering creating this role. And do reach out to colleagues in other trusts as well who, have, um, who already have these posts in place. Patient needs are multifactorial and to understand those, we need to communicate with patients on a wider scale and individually. And assisted mealtimes is that key opportunity to improve a patient's nutritional status. We really hope to have some newly published resources to share with you all in the coming months. Thank you very much.